Is this the big reset Australia needs? What changes will outlive the pandemic and what reforms might come from it? Can Australia use this moment to reimagine the way we live, work, commute and learn? Tonight, we'll hear some big and bold ideas from our guests and we'll hear from you. We're thrilled to have some of you back in the studio tonight at a very safe distance, of course. You've got the questions, now let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Good evening and welcome to the program. Joining me tonight, NITV science and tech editor Ray Johnston, urban planning obsessive businesswoman and former Lord Mayor Lucy Turnbull. The chief scientist Alan Finkel, anthropologist and AI specialist Genevieve Bell and engineer Jordan Newen. Also joining the discussion later in the program, women's advocate Georgie Dent, who's spearheading a campaign to extend free childcare. Remember, you can stream us on iView, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and the Gram. Quanda is the hashtag. Uh, we'd love to hear some of your big ideas as well, so send them our way. And it's great to have some people back in the studio audience. I can't tell you how nice it is to see you. Our first question tonight is from David Hammond. Thanks, Hamish and uh, panel. Uh, given we've had this incredible virus, our country, the whole world really, but our country's come to a halt or at least a pause, it seems surely it's an opportunity for us to reflect on who we want to be, uh, not just what we want to do, who we want to be, what's important to us. Um, it feels like to do that we need some courageous leadership. Uh, I have a concern that perhaps our leadership's a little ill-prepared for that discussion, to, to lead us through that discussion. So I was wondering what, uh, from where you sit, what you, what's your proposal or how do you see us making our way to reimagine our future as a nation? Genevieve Bell, let me start with you. Will your elevator pitch for a different Australia? Listen, Aisha, I think the answer isn't a big answer, it's a small answer. I think one of the things that was really striking for me coming out of the last summer and coming out of the last two months is that Australia's at a social scale we've actually had a moment of being collective, not just individual, and there was something really powerful in reflecting on what I remember of the summer, of all these small communities and people coming together at a human and a social scale. And I think the most startling thing to me about the last two months is how much we have been willing to act as a group, not just as individuals. And when I think about the places I've spent my time, the US in particular, they look at us with envy. And I, what I wanna take out of this is that piece, the piece about being in it together, not in it alone. Lucy Turnbull. Well, I'm sort of segueing beautifully from what Genevieve was just saying. I think this experience of the bushfires and, and the COVID uh, pandemic has actually taught us to relocalise. To, mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, to relocalise and reconnect with our community, you know, in a much more local way and urban planning, in you know, urban planning terms, the 30-minute city has never been more important. But on another level, we've actually learnt to communicate with people in completely different ways, which is, I think, very important too. But I think as we come out of it, we've got to learn the great things we've learnt, that we can mm -hmm. work remotely, but not everybody can work remotely. And we have got to rebuild a world that I think is, you know, in, certainly in an urban sense and a national sense, we've got to build a zero carbon, you know, post-COVID world if we're going to survive and not have you know, sort of rolling catastrophes like the bushfires coming at us every summer. This is a really future-focused question, Jordan Ewan. What is your idea? How do you envisage Australia differently today compared with maybe what you did a few months ago? Well, I think from that big love to the fireys, to the nurses and doctors and the people who have been on the front lines who have really been there for us and, uh, and you know, this is a time that we need to see as an opportunity in some ways, as difficult as, as it is, to, uh, to reflect on our own lives, to the, th the things that matter to us individually, our purposes, as well as, um, as a community. So I think it's a time to, to really figure out where we want to go in our future, but also as a country. But when you imagine that, what do you see for Australia? I see Australia moving into a more inclusive space. I think uh, the fact that we have been reconnecting with each other in that, um, and, and like you, you said, Genevieve, being there, uh, connected together, being there and taking 
each other through this, uh, this difficult time, I think we need to reimagine a better future which is, uh, which is more inclusive. And sometimes we might need to look to the, the levels of science and technology that we could harness as tools in these, uh, in these movements. Uh, but it's always about what is the purpose behind it? What are we actually trying to achieve as we move into this future? And I think uh, inclusion is a big thing. It's interesting. Scientists, policy makers, policy thinkers, you're all naming sort of social ideas as actually the way forward for us. Alan Finkel, uh, how do you envisage Australia's future? Well, Hamish, I could certainly add to that. It's been really wonderful to see that we're not being divisive for the first time for a long time. We've got collective, inclusive government and evidence-based government. But to go to your actual question as to what I see as a big opportunity for Australia, it's in that area of energy, renewable energy. We have an opportunity that's been talked about for a long time but is going to be realised in the next few years to export renewable energy from Australia to the continents around the world. I'm talking about renewable energy, solar energy from the sunshine, wind electricity, which starts with sunshine, creating warm ground and ultimately the wind, and hydroelectricity, which starts, which starts with sunshine heating the oceans and uh, ultimately creating the rain that we collect. And if we can bottle all of that electricity and send it around the world for the benefit of other countries, I call that shipping sunshine. And so that, that's my big idea. All right, we're going to come to the energy question in more detail during the program, but your elevator pitch, Ray Johnston? Yeah, I, I think for me this time has really highlighted that we're not all on the same playing field, really. Mm -hmm. we're, we've all come into this from different places with you know, different backgrounds. And for me, I think I want to see an end to people coming to work sick. But for that to happen, I know that this is a very small thing compared to these big things, but in order for that to happen, we need to all have access to sick leave. You know, for 15 years I worked in hospitality, multiple shifts. I had to make decisions sometimes between, you know, do I go to work and serve people food while I have a cold and I could infect them, or do I... You know, support my son and I and pay our rent and our food this week. And that's not a decision that anyone in this country should have to make. So I think that if we're going to be able to have social distancing continue, if we are infectious, if we have a virus, to be able to look after our community, individuals need to be empowered to be able to do that. Right. Well, throughout tonight, we're going to touch on all of these areas from social policy to technology to energy and science as well. Let's take our next question from Timothy Lim, also with us in the studio. I'll, I'll thank you all. I uh, would like to pose a question more related to the economy and I guess it's also re relevant to the social side because uh, from this crisis we can see that our economy is quite vulnerable to some of the uh, economy shock. So my question is related to some of the technology that we can adopt because for the past 20 years we have been blindsided by mining bombs. So there are a lot of different technology developed across the world, but we have not actually participated in them. So that's, for example, in the de developing world, we have India that has become the software engineering giant. We have China that has become the factory of the world, including some of the most advanced technology. We have Taiwan that has emerged as the high-tech hardware designer, specifically the microchips. And we have South Korea that has become one of the biggest car and mobile ma producer in the world. Well, crucially, Australia does have the technology know-how, but we have not commercialized them very uh, widely, I guess. Because, for example, we do have CSL, we do have Cochlear, we do have Mesoblast, we do have uh, the solar panel that originally it started in UNSW. It was developed, the technology was developed in the UNSW Research Centre. And just yesterday, we have the quickest internet that developed by Swinburne, Monash, and uh, RMIT University. So we do have the technologies know-how, but would it be appropriate to suggest that maybe it's time we start to think about how to grow the pie instead of how we distribute it, whether we have the tax cuts for this particular thing or tax subsidies for this particular thing. We can grow the pie. Say, for example, what about we have a Tesla of Australia how does that sound? Jordan, let me put that to you. 
Yeah, I think um, what you're raising there with, I mean, there's, there's the technological infrastructure that is behind uh, things like the digital economy. And having uh, technologies moving as fast as they are across the world, it is, it's true. We're seeing massive movements in many different countries. Um, and at the same time, Australia does play on that, uh, in that field as well in many of our things like, uh, like biomedical technologies, our, our medical and health technologies I think are, are fantastic. Um, we've been moving into other spaces as well like artificial intelligence, a little bit in the robotic space, um, but we always apply them, what I see a lot in the startup communities as well, we start up um, with these different types of technologies and the different ideas, but we really start with purpose behind them. Um, so I think a lot of the collaborations that need to happen are going to be between uh, universities, not-for-profits, uh, businesses, startups, because everyone brings something different to the table. So we need to focus on those, those collaborations. Uh, we do have a lot of great intellectual property that comes from uh, universities as well, and I think starting to translate that a lot more into commercial benefit. But is, how do we do that when at the same time we're pulling research funding out of universities and Ray Johnson uh, also not providing things like JobKeeper to so many university staff? Isn't that going to hamper our ability to come out of this? through research and development? Yeah, absolutely. We need to be investing in this. Uh, you know, we do have some brilliant minds in this country that are well supported by the equally brilliant people within the education system. But if they're not supported every step of the way, we're just going to fail. You know, further to your point up there, the, the solar panels that were developed by the Sun King, went on to be China's richest man for a period of time. That was developed here in Australia, but he had to go overseas to get the support that he needed in order to turn that into a business. Uh, I can see Alan Finkel trying to get in. Um, thank you, Hamish. It, it's really important um, we heard about some of the fantastic biomedical medical device and um, biomedical successes, but don't forget we've had successes in digital areas such as Atlassian and now mm -hmm. Afterpay. But the really unsung hero that people don't value is the advanced artificial intelligence applications in our mining industry. Uh, people think of us as shipping iron ore. There's nothing unique or special about iron ore, but it's how we get that iron ore out of the ground and prepare it for shipping that makes Australia the absolute leader. 50% of iron ore exports around the world come from Australia. It's not because we have the lowest salaries. It's not because we have the easiest access to markets. It's because we are applying artificial intelligence technologies, automation, developed between our big mining companies and some of our large universities to great success. So I think it's important to recognise what we have achieved across the non-obvious parts of the economy. But Genevieve Bell, don't we need to be investing in research and development, though, if this is going to be our pathway out? And, uh, I mean, there's a lot of research which is showing the impact already uh, that this current moment is going to have on universities' ability to continue research work. Well, of course we do. And I think it's one of those interesting choices you have to make as a nation about where you want to place your bets and what you invest in. I was lucky enough to spend the last 20 years in Silicon Valley and the company that I worked for firmly believed that the place you put your money during a global downturn was in R&D. And the basis was you needed to have ideas when the economy turned that you could do something interesting with. And so for me, I've always thought that in moments like this, there are a lot of choices and a portfolio of them you need to make. But one of them is you actually need to be investing in research and development. It needs to be blended. It needs to pull in universities. It also needs to pull in industry. It needs to make sure that it's distributed beyond the obvious places to include a broader collection of people. But no, you actually have to make a decision about doing so. But also um, the translation of that research is also absolutely. very important. And establishing it such that people don't think that doing the research is the only piece, right? It's always R&D for me. You've got to have the research piece and the development piece, and you need to have an investments and uh, capacity to celebrate both ends of that. Mm. I think we've got a lot better at the D over the last few years. There's a yeah. there's a much more, you know, a deeper and and a you know sort of more diverse startup culture in Australia than there was about five years ago, I think. And I think Absolutely. I, and that is quite a remarkable step forward. Um, and I think it, and we can build on that. But, of course, a lot of the research and the original ideas for that do come from universities, not always from universities, but having a healthy, uh, you know, sort of uh, competent and capable and brilliant uh, university sector is fundamental to any nation which has, you know, sort of ambitions of being a clever nation. So, to be clear, should we be spending more on it now? Should we be making big announcements, big commitments 
about uh, what we're sinking into research and development? Well, it depends on how you do it, but I th I'm, I'm worried about the attrition of human capital and talent out of the university sector at the moment, to the extent that becomes, you know, as that, that is sustained. I think that's quite a worry is to lose human capital. We should be building our human capital. Are you worried about that, Alan Finkel? All of these staff, casuals, it would seem a lot of them that are working in the universities, some, many on research uh, projects, that just simply aren't eligible for the JobKeeper and so are therefore uh, losing either their hours or their jobs? Look, it's a genuine concern. Um, people on short-term contracts and casuals are at risk of losing their jobs. The universities are trying as hard as they can, but it's not clear for how long they can keep those jobs uh, open. The what, what we need as a country is for that research capability to be with us now going into the future so that ultimately research and development can contribute to taking Australia not back to where we were before the crises began, but to a better place. And... With so, so, so is it enough, for Alan Finkel, for the government to just say, well, universities get a lot of government backing already, that funding will remain there, but not do any more and, in fact, keep them out of the JobKeeper program? Look, the, the, the funding is, is a serious challenge. The universities have been investing a lot of their own money in topping up the money that's available from philanthropy and from government over the years, and a lot of their revenue source is at risk. So there's concern, it's recognised. Uh, we need to see investment to keep the research activity at the universities and the medical research institutes going. The publicly funded research agencies, which are on appropriation from uh, government budget funds, uh, probably doing it best in the sense that they have a steady source of income, but they are, are seeing their additional sources of income at risk. Uh, Hamish, it's, it's a concern that we have to address. All right. Our next question tonight comes from Asosa Edmonds. Hi, my question is for Dr Nguyen. I work with people with disabilities and I'm just wondering if you're able to help inspire them with a little bit of more independence and help build them a car to drive. Um, <laughs> I don't know if this kind of technology is available at the moment and I just think it would be amazing, how amazing it would be if um, this car is a sensor motion car and it's able to m map out what the driver is thinking and then take that driver to that destination. Well, thought control technology is is it's exciting stuff. I mean, it's it's out there. It's um, able to be utilised in many different ways. And what I found going through uh, research at university, my uh, PhD was on uh, controlling a wheelchair with the power of the mind. And I was inspired in initially just by friends of mine with various disabilities that I wanted to uh, build a, a technology for. So that's where I started. And uh, moving from there, we started realising if you can look at a person's abilities, that's where we start. We go with the ability and then use that to, uh, to do whatever it is the person dreams of doing. So we've had many families reach out to us. I've got a social business in, uh, in Sydney uh, called Psychonetic and we've been building, uh, we've done eye-controlled vehicles, um, eye-controlled music. That's where we sort of started to focus to begin with, um, uh, from mind control to eye control. These things are, are possible. It's, it's uh, bringing together a combination of biomedical technologies, artificial intelligence, sometimes robotic technology as well. And, uh, and it's really cool because this is what we are capable of uh, producing. So we have collaborations with many other uh, businesses and, uh, and researchers out there. And this is why when we were in university, when I was going through university with some of my mates, I was finding it just a little bit disheartening that I couldn't see a lot of the translation of this amazing research through to the people who needed it. And, uh, and so coming out of university myself, I thought I didn't, I didn't do this for a piece of paper, I didn't do this to, to write some publications and that was about it. Um, I decided that I was going to take that on and, uh, and to, to create my own business in an area that we couldn't see uh, where the benefits would be apart from if we were to build these technologies and get them out to the people, then we could find the benefit from that. And, uh, and so we started working very closely with a lot of communities, a lot of people, and this is what I, I talk about. Technology should be made more inclusive from the ground up and that's what we're able to do. Um, as soon as you start to see other new ideas coming out and new technologies emerging, sometimes they might seem a bit gimmicky. If you look at uh, extended reality technology, uh, you can come up with big ideas, build these things for a fraction of the cost of what you could 
uh, 10 years ago, and now we're seeing the likes of uh, virtual reality technology being used in spinal cord rehabilitation, in things that are going against all the science that we've ever known about the spinal cord, how it works, how we're able to be rehabilitated in certain ways. And, uh, and so we've seen things like that particular project, virtual reality being used to help a person uh, overcome some of uh, the, uh, the, the uh, mobility issues that come with uh, spinal cord injury. But it goes across many different types of disabilities and many different technologies could be utilised, but it's how we approach it. I was interested to read, though, in your background that it was actually a moment of personal crisis in many ways that led you uh, to doing all of this work. You, you were diving into a swimming pool one day. What happened? Uh, yeah, that's, that's where everything changed for me. Um, I took on electrical engineering at university, hoping to get into robotics and AI very kind of blindly in the early 2000s. And, uh, and I took on uh, those types of projects, but didn't find a lot of uh, fulfilment in it. And after almost breaking my neck diving into a backyard pool, uh, it just changed everything for me. It just changed the way that I was perceiving my own existence uh, and a lot of the purpose that I had out there. I just, I didn't really have a great direction. So I started going out and meeting people and hearing people's stories. And this is something that is great about the work that I see in a lot of cases, um, especially in the entrepreneurial community uh, in Australia, is that we connect with people in the community. We find out what issues actually matter, uh, what people actually want. And, uh, and so I started going out and learning about people with uh, various disabilities from cerebral palsy, motor neuron, Parkinson's, uh, strokes, and, uh, and, and the likes. And it was just, what I found was I was meeting people who, in a lot of cases, were more positive, uh, had more going for them and were doing actually more with their life than I was. I met friends who uh, could only move their eyes yet were running successful businesses and I thought, what's my excuse? So I started thinking bigger and that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do in Australia. We need to think big, connect with the people and, uh, and drive forward a better future. All right. Our next question tonight is from Lucy Lynn. Good evening, panel. Very, very great to be here. Um, small number, but you know, it's um, it's it's very good to be with human co connection again. Um, thank you so much for the discussion so far. I'm the founder of Forest Lynn, and I really worry about the future state of entrepreneurship in this country, especially from the effects of the global pandemic. Innovation will go backwards if we don't make this a priority in assisting startups during a really rough time. Additionally, statistics from the US show that women receive only about 3% of venture capitalist funding. So in other words, male-led ventures receive 97% of all funding, and I'm sure the Australian figures will be fairly similar. So my question for the panel tonight is, as a woman in technology, what can we do more to promote more female founders in this country and also the entire startup ecosystem as well? Ray Johnston. I'm a big fan of mentorship. Uh, I, I'm actually a founding mentor with an organisation called The Working Lunch, which supports underrepresented people in the games industry in Australia, which is 82% male and overwhelmingly white. Uh, so, you know, we needed to band together and help each other. We have so much knowledge and skills between us. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like an extension of what Jordan was saying. Yeah, we come together, we collaborate and we share what we have with each other rather than succumbing to seeing each other as competition. We can't, absolutely cannot fall into that in any way, shape or form. And I genuinely believe that we have power when we work together and we have strength in numbers and we can support each other. And we all have such vast experiences ac across STEM in general, not just in tech, that we can teach each other. And we've all been in situations where we can advise someone else and say, hey, I've been there. This is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. And that's really the only way forward that I can see. I think in a world where we are seen as scrambling for the very few jobs that exist amongst ourselves, we, we have to work together. Uh, Jennifer Bell, uh, th three decades in Silicon Valley, uh, heavily male-dominated environment. Huh? How can we as a society trust, uh, I guess, a sector that is so dominated by one gender to carve out the way forward? Well, I think you probably can't. I mean, I don't mean that in a kind of you should then dismiss it. I think it means you actually have to work to change it. And I think, you know, if I look at 
a number of companies, both in the US and Australia in the tech sector, there's a commitment to doing things differently and you see it in everything from how they make decisions about leadership to how they make decisions about investments to how they decide to position themselves and what they care about. But in order to make that work, I mean, Rose is exactly right. You have to have a strong culture about mentorship. You have to have a strong culture of advocacy and sponsorship. But I think you also can't keep asking women and other minorities to be better and better. You also have to ask that the men in the system and make room. And so I think, you know, one of the most interesting lessons I learned in my time in the US was that as teams get more diverse, you have to actually think about how you handle conflict because more people from more different places, more opinions, <laughs> and not everyone kind of has the same way of thinking about things. So you have to be willing to create space for that. And I think the nicest mantra I ever heard was one of my colleagues and woman who became a friend of mine said, listen, you have to have diversity, but then you have to have inclusion and you'll know you've succeeded when people feel like they really belong there. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that sort of troika turns out to be really important. And I think the way to think about it in terms of should we trust those companies, it's not about whether we should trust them or not. It's about what we should be asking them to do differently. Mm. I agree with um, the comments that everyone else has made, but can I just say one of my finest achievements in my own mind is that we established the Greater Sydney Commission back in 2016, and over two thirds of the leadership group is female, which is a pretty, there's not many, you know, sort of government agency type entities which have that sort of uh, track record. But overall, the pop, the, uh, it's a very gender diverse, but, you know, highly concentrated with women completely on merit. And, you know, having so many women working in the organisation on planning, you know, for a better future for Greater Sydney actually gave people a really good insight and one of our sort of core mantras was to develop a female friendly city and sort of make it accessible and and good about how you move around and and when you think about it that has indirect flow on effects for women in innovation a lot of the time innovators have to work after office hours so they have to feel feel safe moving around the streets at night you know when they're able to gather in restaurants and bars etc it's that mobility and that inclusion which is so important so i think Anybody in a leadership position has a, a real obligation, and I know that everybody here understands that and lives that too, to mm. actually include mm. women to the ma maximum extent possible, because I tell you what, when you do, you'll have a much more effective organisation. But to Genevieve's point, uh, let's put some, uh, some spotlight on a male in the sector, Alan Finkel. Uh, I mean, <laughs> don't you actually have to do more as a male, as a leading male voice in a sector like this? If we're going to be so reliant on science and technology and research and development on the other side of this pandemic to make sure that it reflects our society more broadly? Uh, absolutely. And we've already heard about the important role of mentorship, but also leadership. Um, I'm a member of the Male Champions of Change for STEM, which uh, is male CEOs who are taking strategic approaches to being inclusive at work. And don't forget also the extraordinary importance of that agent for social change over decades, in fact, over centuries, which is the university system. And the university system in Australia um, has signed up to a program called SAGE, where pretty much all the universities commit themselves to a plan for, for equity, for inclusiveness, to give opportunities to women at every single level in the university. Uh, because one of the challenges that we face, of course, is drop-off of women as you go up through the management ranks. That program called SAGE is making a difference. It takes time, but as SAGE uh, rolls out, we will see more and more social impact led by the universities. OK. Our next question tonight is a video from Daniel Caffrey in Taralgon, Victoria. As a person from a farming background in Gippsland, I'm concerned that the gas-led recovery means that uh, vast areas of prime farming country will be impacted by gas extraction. This puts at risk our, the premium price we get paid for our produce because it will no longer be seen as clean and green. Why is the main thing suggested so far a gas-led recovery? And wasn't this a foregone conclusion given that the Prime Minister stacked his uh, COVID commission with gas and fossil fuel industry operatives. 
Ray Johnston. Good question, Daniel. That's my question as well. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, I do have some concerns when it comes to you know, gas being touted as the way out of this, you know, for Australia's economic recovery. It, it, the solution does raise more questions than answers for me. You know, why have we chosen an industry that employs less than 0.2% of the workforce, you know, pre-COVID, rather than one of the industries that you know, employs lots of people. You know, why, why are we choosing to support an industry that raises questions in regards to its environmental impact? And there was some wording that came out of that recommendation that really concerned me, uh, which was uh, cutting the red and green tape. And I'd love some clarification as to what cutting the red and green tape actually means. Does that... You're talking about this report that was part of, commissioned as part of the Absolutely. COVID commission process, which yeah. is not policy yet by no, no. any stretch. But it's advice and you would assume that if people have been brought together for advice that they're going to be listened to, you'd, you'd hope so mm. at the least. You know, but does cutting red and green tape mean you know, no environmental impact statements? Does it mean that we're not looking at the impact on groundwater, which we still know so little about, which is so crucial to Australia and water is such a precious resource? You know, and does cutting that red and green tape extend to having conversations with traditional owners and, and native title mm. claims? Mm. You know, th this is questions that aren't really raised with other industries that we could be supporting. And I'm interested because I know, Alan Finkel, uh, <laughs> you, you have some you know, strong feelings, strong positive feelings about gas in regards to you know, bridging that gap between renewables and, and what Australia requires. But what is it about gas that we're getting you know, that outweighs all of these negatives that we couldn't potentially get you know, from battery storage, which can pay for itself within two years? So the answer to your question is that it's all about scale and speed. Uh, it's not about, in my opinion, about building the gas industry for the sake of the gas industry. It's gas as an enabler. What I've been talking about consistently is moving towards a what I call an electric planet, a, a society where all of our energy needs come from clean electricity. The quicker we can get there, the better. Now, I think that if we just try to bring on a lot of solar and a lot of wind electricity and hydroelectricity, but solar and wind in particular, and rely only on battery storage to give it its firming, to make sure that we can dispatch energy when we need it, there will be a limited rate given the availability and cost of batteries, there will be a li limited rate at how fast we can develop solar and wind. But gas has much, much more scale than batteries. And gas is effectively the perfect complement to solar and wind. We can build a lot of solar and a lot of wind and use gas for the times when we don't have the sunshine and the wind uh, blowing, uh, you know, to deliver the energy that we need. We can bring on vastly more renewable electricity if we can support it. And in the short term, the easiest way to support it is with gas. Maybe 20 or 30 years from now, we'll have new kinds of batteries, vastly powerful, more extensive batteries, and we can do it with batteries. But gosh, the quickest way to develop our renewable electricity system is to support it with gas. And so when you say short term, what exactly do you mean? Because we now have uh, reports of uh, proposals to build a gas pipeline from Western Australia to the east to deliver some of these resources. I mean, that would take a lot of time and would need to service for a fairly long period of time to make it worthwhile. How long do you think we should be relying on gas for as this transitional energy? The reality is we're going to need to rely on it for 10, 20, perhaps 30 years. Uh, transforming an energy system at a national scale or at a global scale is extraordinarily difficult and consistently underestimated by people. We're talking about the proverbial super tanker that has so much inertia that you can't turn it quickly. So, Hamish, my specific answer would be one, two, up to three decades. Uh, Lucy Turnbull? Um, well, I find that a little bit troubling because I think we have to have a national and a global goal of having net zero carbon 
by 2050 at the latest, ideally 2040. And the way to get there is have renewables plus storage. Now, storage is not just batteries. You can have pumped hydro and battery. the battery technology revolution is really amongst us. I think if we overinvest in gas um, and we think about it for the next 10, 20, 30 years, that's about the same as building a power station with a, a somewhat lower emissions profile, but not a zero emissions profile. And we have to, you know, reconceive our world in the post-COVID world as a post-carbon world. And we do that by not just doing the transitional stuff, do that to the bare minimum you need, but actually to look forward. And that's the opportunity we have now to the post-carbon world. Uh, Alan Finkel, you chair the Technology Investment Roadmap Ministerial Reference Group. That's working with Angus Taylor, the Energy Minister, looking at all the different uh, options as far as technologies are concerned uh, for Australia's energy future. But it seems you and many members of the government are already convinced that gas is the way forward. Have you already reached a conclusion on this? No, the answer is no. Um, I was giving you my, my personal opinion based on a few years of looking at this. But what we're doing in the low, te lo the low emissions technology roadmap is a consultation process. We've started off with a large suite of possible technologies. We're looking at them through consultation with the broader community to choose those or to identify those that have the largest scale potential to for abatement, to reduce emissions, the largest economic opportunity, and also those that will build on Australia's comparative advantages. So, no, nothing is foregone. I was responding to a specific question. Let me sure, also but, but, point but can, out can, that... Can I just be clear for our audience, though, watching tonight? I mean, it is not just you. The Prime Minister told the National Press Club in January that gas has a critical role to play. Nev Power, who heads the Commission, uh, is talking about the options to connect our major demand centres with our major supply centres in terms of gas. Angus Taylor, uh, on April 23rd, has been talking about a gas-fired recovery. And, as I mentioned, you told the National Press, Cl Press, Press Club in February, in the short term, natural gas will play that critical role. I mean, at a very senior level, there's a lot of consistency here about the role of gas. But it is a role that will help us to get to low emissions more quickly. It's not fair to say, look, gas is half or a bit less than the emissions from coal. Because when it's in a support role for solar and wind, it's got the other advantage of being able to ramp up and ramp down very quickly. So you don't have to use it as much as you would coal. Coal doesn't ramp up or ramp down quickly, so you've got to keep the coal-fired electricity going even when you've got plenty of solar and electricity and wind electricity. You don't use the gas as much. It's there to support the system. So it's got advantages. And another thing that's worth considering is that Yes, it might be a 10 or 20 or up to 30 year transition, but as we develop our ability to produce clean hydrogen, those gas turbines can be repurposed to run not on natural gas, but on the clean hydrogen. So there's a, actually a transition pathway to utilising that investment, also for firming the electricity system, but using hydrogen that you've produced from clean electricity to give you the energy when you need it. So I did want to ask you about that because when you talk about Australia potentially uh, exporting uh, renewable energy in the future, you talk about a hydrogen uh, uh, future, uh, also the possibility of Australia uh, getting into green steel uh, using hydrogen. Are you talking about doing this using renewable sources or using fossil fuels? Look, I'm primarily talking about using, using renewable sources, and that's a combination of solar, wind and hydroelectricity. And we're very fortunate that in Australia, not only do we have the largest landmass with intense solar irradiation, but many of the sites have coincident wind energy as well. Or in Tasmania, you've got coincident wind energy and hydroelectricity. And when you've got two going for you, you can get a more consistent, steady output, which makes the economics of making the hydrogen more, more, more effective. We can build up that renewable electricity-driven hydrogen industry from today 
incrementally. There is a separate pathway that you referred to, and that is to make hydrogen from either coal or natural gas. And people all around the world are talking about doing it. I, I need the to bring only in Turnbull because she's shaking her head furiously here. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it would be a huge opportunity if we missed, if we didn't go straight to green hydrogen, Alan. I know you're very passionate about it, so I'm a little bit surprised that you're suddenly saying, oh, yes, let's, bring, let's build coal... Um, hydrogen and, you know, gas hydrogen, it, you know, you can do it. But how sustainable is it? What will the time horizon for any investment be if we're going to a zero carbon world? It might only have a 10 or 15 year time horizon. So who's going to invest in that? And if, if the public, if public, the public has to invest in that through the gov government investment decisions, and it's got a very short time horizon for return, it could be a wasted, stranded asset and a waste of money very quickly, you know? It, it could actually be a stranded asset if you're going to build pipelines all over the countryside and stuff. It may not be the case, but I think you have to build a very clear argument for why it's a sensible idea for, to be doing this massive investment in gas if there are other pathways to get to a lower emission standard. Right. Lucy, if we're talking about produce, building a hydrogen industry, it's only worth doing and we'll only have customers if it's clean hydrogen. Yeah. So if it comes from, say, coal, as is being contemplated, but not committed to, but contemplated in the Latrobe Valley, that will only get up as a project if the developers can show that they can do that without emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere or such a trivial amount that the net, the, the, the net benefit is huge. Now, I don't know whether that's possible. There's a lot of reason to think that it is plausible, but the commercial study hasn't been done and probably won't be done for another three or four years. But if they can justify the project on cost and if they can permanently bury the carbon dioxide and do it in a provable way then you're producing clean hydrogen. The hydrogen itself is a molecule. Okay. You, you can't tell by looking at the hydrogen whether it came from a solar source or from a natural gas source. But you can, through the carbon um, dioxide accounting, tell whether there was carbon dioxide emitted in the production of that hydrogen. Okay. And that's what's important. So the goal is not to emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. OK, well, I think our goal should be, if we're going to be aspirational and visionary about the future after this crisis, is to... Is to um, to have the goal of having the emissions profile and aspirations of, say, Denmark with the energy costs of Saudi Arabia. So if you have that goal, then what is your pathway to get there? Okay. And it probably isn't gas. We're going to have to get some, to some other big ideas. Our next question tonight <laughs> is a video from Katrina Ashmore in Bundaberg, Queensland. Hi, I have a question for the panel regarding the free childcare package. If the free childcare package is set to continue past June 28th this year, how are your family daycare educators, services and operators going to remain financially viable to continue to deliver a service to our Australian families if the government does not fund it 100%? We have family daycare educators continuing to deliver a service at capacity and not be paid. They are doing many hours for free. How is this OK? Thank you. All right, I'm going to bring in women's advocate Georgie Dent now, who's got a big idea on childcare, but I'm going to ask you first to deal with that question. Family daycare, Georgie, uh, typically involves accredited operators running uh, the business from their home. Uh, in this instance, they don't qualify for JobKeeper, at least mostly, uh, but they're still required to offer their service free of charge. Uh, the government's saying that only reimburse them 50% of fees up to a capped rate. That doesn't sound like a great deal for these people. No, and it absolutely is not um, a, an, an adequate situation. So, more broadly, the, the problem is that the, the government introduced a rescue package um, for early childhood education and care because we were on the brink of the sector collapsing. So, because throughout March, with the increasing health risk that COVID-19 was posing and the job losses that were being inflicted, up to 40% of children who had, had been enrolled in services were taken out. Now, that was either because parents were concerned about the health or because they'd lost their jobs and paying for childcare was simply no longer affordable. What the government came in and did is absolutely not a perfect model and it, is, it has been particularly um, disastrous for the family daycare operators. But what it has done is allowed the majority of services at this point to stay open. 
Now, what we would say to the government is we do not want to extend free childcare under the current model because it's a perfect arrangement. It is absolutely not. But what would be far less perfect would be snapping back to the old model, which is absolutely no longer sustainable. We are in a completely different economy. We are in a different world. We are now facing high unemployment. And what that means for the sector is almost certain collapse. Because what we have seen, we did a survey this week of 2,000 um, families with children enrolled in care. 44% of households had um, seen a reduction in their income or a job loss. In 17% of those households, both parents have lost jobs. We know that across the board in um, early education services at the moment, we are at about a 63% attendance rate. Now that's an average, but that is not viable. That is well below break-even point for any service. So, so then, so then the what's the big idea? Family day... So the big idea is that this is... Tinkering with a broken old system is absolutely not the option right now. We need to radically reimagine early childhood education and basically, fundamentally, we need to extend it into part of our education system. Um, we know, so throughout COVID, um, there has been very much warranted angst and discussion and debate about how schools could continue to deliver education to kids. At one point, no one has said an adequate solution would be a school closing or a teacher losing their job. Our position is that early childhood education should have the same certainty that school funding does. Educators in early childhood are among the lowest paid workers in Australia, and yet the work they do is among the most valuable. For every dollar the government spends on early childhood education, we get $2 in return. The benefits for children socially and cognitively are experienced over the course of their lives. So we know that if we invest in early childhood education, we are investing in making Australia a far more sustainable and, um, a, and a brighter place. In, okay. And I, So I, what I would say to Katrina is I am so sorry that right now family daycare operators have been put in an untenable position because unlike big centres who have seen a reduction in numbers, because family daycares are smaller, they haven't seen a reduction in numbers. So they are trying to do exactly the same job with half the money, if not less than half the money. Okay. And what we would say to government is that is an issue to be addressed, but it is not a reason to snap back to an old model that is unsustainable. So, Ray Johnson, what do you make of that? I mean, you've raised a child yourself. You were a single mum for a pretty lengthy period of time. What do you think of the, the big idea there, which is to basically included in the education system, make early childhood care uh, free continuously. Look, I, I know that this is supposed to be a panel of differing views, but this makes a lot of sense to me. You know, Georgie's obviously an expert in this field and has put a lot of, of thought and time into it, and it's something that I could imagine absolutely having worked for me when I was in a situation when I needed childcare for my son, you know. As, as it was when my son was quite small, you know, I had to make decision between do I survive on single parent payment or do I get a job? which will end up making me have less money in my hand at the end of the week than if I just sit here and take the single parent payment. That's, people shouldn't have to be in that situation and obviously it's very different for parents who are already in the workforce, but we should be making it as easy as possible for parents to go to work. Jordan, I think members of your team have contemplated stepping out uh, during this time because of the pressures, right? Uh, yeah, I actually um, almost lost one of our key uh, people in, in my team in Psykinetic and, um, and it was because suddenly she was thrown into to having to, uh, to teach a kid at home as well as uh, trying to manage a lot of the, the business and marketing um, and she was quite new to the role at, uh, with us and she's managed to, to make it work in that time. We were just being really flexible at Mm. As flexible as so, we so do you think an idea yeah. like this would change the makeup of your workforce? Absolutely. Would it be easier to uh, attract different genders into this area of work? Absolutely. And I guess coming back to it before, it's you know I don't I don't see the hiring process as sort of being you know I've got to fill quotas or or tick boxes. I um I just go for who is the right person for this position. Whenever we put a position out there, we just hire the right person. Uh, we're about fifty fifty, I think, with. Um, with gender, and I just hadn't even thought about it until it was raised here. Um, but yeah, absolutely. is that a problem? Early... Is that no. a problem that you haven't thought about it? <laughs> it uh, maybe it's a problem I hadn't, hadn't really sort of given it thought. It's just because I felt like we were 
going in the right direction anyway. As a, yeah. as a fairly small team, we just work really hard. We build uh, teams of very passionate people. And I think um, the early childhood education side is just is so incredibly important. And that's what I, I'd agree with there, absolutely. Because um, what children learn and what they take with them for life, we're finding it's, it's uh, you know, you can you can see those those changes from that point in time, from the when a child is young, if they've been given those those adequate resources, they've been given uh, that education and that uh, belief in that child uh, through life, is, it's it's huge, the uh, the flow on impacts from right. that. Our next question is from Jade Lee Lowe in Port Kennedy, Western Australia. Hi, panel. I wonder if with the recent COVID restrictions have caused more of us to rethink a lifestyle that's been dominated by materialistic and consumer-driven concerns. If instead we should learn to refocus on our health, not just physical and mental health, but spiritual and community health as well. In fact, I wonder if trying a four day working week would be one of the ways to try and achieve this. Four days for your work and your country, three days for you, your family and your community. Thank you, bye. Georgie Dent, four day working week. Sign me up. Um, I think that it is, I mean, it, there's actually been a number of um, examples recently. A couple of big companies in New Zealand trialled this two years ago, not because of COVID-19, but just to see what happened. And they put everyone on a four-day working week. Everyone was still paid um, a five-day week. And everyone was told, you just make it work. And productivity went up, um, profitability went up, and staff engagement and satisfaction went up. So I think one of the issues that has been discussed tonight and, and where childcare is particularly um, critical is in women's workforce participation. So we know that the, um, in Australia, we have a real issue with workforce participation. Our, the rate of women's workforce particip participation in global terms lags the rest of the world. We are 49th in the world in terms of women's workforce participation. And one of the reasons for that is that we have not, as a country, invested in the vital infrastructure that enables families to combine paid work uh, with their family responsibilities. Childcare is an enormous piece of that puzzle. And the reason for that is, again, in global terms, in Australia, families spend 25% um, on average of their household income on childcare. In the OECD nations, the average that's spent is 11%. So we make it really difficult for families to, to work and to care for children. And what we see is a lot of families make the decision that one person will stop work. Mm. Predominantly, we see that it's women. We've already seen with um, the figures from COVID-19, women are bearing the brunt of the job losses. The survey that we ran through the parenthood last week confirmed that, that it is women who have um, taken a hit when it's come to their work. And alarmingly, 50% of those people have said that because of the job losses, they will have to um, reduce and remove their children from care and further cut back their work because they can't do that. At this point in time, when we are entering what is likely to be a prolonged period of at least an economic slump, if not a recession, it's absolutely critical that we invest in anything that is going to make it easier for families uh, to get back to work. Because okay. what will happen if, if we lose childcare altogether... Aside from the benefits that children miss out on on the education, but parents will not be able to get back to work if and when there are jobs available. And that is absolutely uh, not an opportunity that we can miss. Georgie Dent, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And our next question is a video from David Broyd in Barden, Queensland. Given Australia's population is predicted to grow by another 50% to 36 million over the next 30 years or so, and a high proportion of people are still likely to work from home, shop online. Do we need to reimagine the structure and infrastructure needs of our cities? And should we give more emphasis to growing our regional centres? Lucy Turnbull. Well, I think we need to do both. And uh, I was actually, um, at the encouragement of my husband, Malcolm, uh, watched Mark Zuckerberg give a, an open lecture, or a sort of talk, to his workforce at Facebook about what the future of look, work looked like in the context of the pandemic. And um, he was talking in particular about remote work. And they've, it's actually quite interesting. Facebook have decided that they will have a particular room, a section of the workforce, you know, able to work remote. So that means that they are completely uh, de-geolocating where the jobs are advertised. They will advertise nationally. And if they want certain skills, they don't care where the people are if they're prepared to work remotely, which actually gives 
huge opportunities to uh, regional towns and and you know rural areas too, which is a fantastic thing. And uh, you, some, he been, said some been... jobs can't be completely remote, um, so they've got to kind of work their way around the jobs that can't be mm. remote. But it ain't, when you think about it, it's actually a huge transformation in, you know, capturing the, the genius and the, the talents of people right around the country. So you've been arguing for some time for these 30-minute cities. You did yep. that in your role with the Greater Sydney Authority. Has this pandemic and this moment changed anything you or thought previously about the way we might design cities and, and the spaces okay. we live in and, and commute within? OK, so... I was charged with, um, you know, being the chief commissioner for the Greater Sydney Commission, so we were thinking about Sydney. And one of the things that we thought was fundamental, which is actually even more important now since the pandemic, is you have to actually conceptualise a large metropolitan area as not just being CBD-focused. You have to mm -hmm. distribute jobs, opportunities, green space, walkability, cyclability, all the things people value now more than ever right across the metropolitan area. So you have to have jobs, uh, universities, education, really well distributed through a metro the metropolitan area of Sydney. So we have this idea of the metropolis of three cities, the eastern city, the central city focused on Parramatta, and then the western parkland city. So that was a way of trying to redistribute jobs and opportunities at the same time as connecting people uh, within 30 minutes. And that's a really important thing to do. But if you extrapolate the learnings from the pandemic and put it into a national context. At the same time as you do that, you can also think about, as a business, expanding the footprint of the people that can apply for jobs to come and work with you so they don't have to move from where they happily may be living in Queensland, I think you are, David, now. Uh, Genevieve, yeah. you've thought a lot about <laughs> the future of work, but perhaps in, in some different contexts. But has this moment changed the way you imagine those things? I know there's enormous amounts of data that are starting to flow in and will continue to, that, that might maybe change the way we imagine the future. Oh, absolutely. But I think it, it, it turns out to be this... Always, it's always, it's always complicated. On the one hand, yes, we can move people into regional and remote Australia. On the other hand, to make that effective, we actually have to continue to invest in a telecommunications network that is functional. We probably need to change some of the standards by which that telecommunication network is configured. Uh, many of us, I expect, who've gone home recently and who are working from spaces that were not intended for that work have discovered that the internet is configured such that it is easier to download things than upload things. That was a decision we made a long time ago here, but if we want to continue to imagine that we are going to distribute ourselves <laughs> across the country in different ways, we'd need to change the way we think about our networks, we need to change the way services were provisioned, we'd need to think differently about how our postal system functions, because actually some things are remote, but there's still some physical things you actually need. So there's a, a set of constraints we don't often talk about when we say we imagine people get to work anywhere. And and do we also have to recalculate what we imagine it will cost uh, to power all oh, of that absolutely. data? Absolutely. So one of the things we almost never talk about, and Alan and I occasionally fiercely debate, uh, is the notion about what a new technological future will cost us. Uh, Jordan and I can talk a lot about AI and data services, but one of the things that we don't often discuss in that is how much energy that actually requires. So when the last study hungry. was done... Uh, artificial intelligence is uh, oh, absolutely... Oh, particularly. When the last study was done two years ago, the data suggested that just the server farms around the world, so just the places that hold the data in your phone or whatever thing you're watching this on, that's 10% of the world's electricity budget just to house data. And so as we think about... And most of us as individuals don't pay that money because you're not fronting a server farm going, can I just have my data allowance? <laughs> Thank you, and here's some money for the electricity bill. But th that has to be paid somewhere, right? And so as we think about a future that involves data... Think about the video conferencing you might have done that any one of us has done that you've done. That requires a server somewhere, that requires a telecommunications network, all of that actually requires energy. And how we think about that moving forward is actually an extraordinary kind of invisible part of the equation. But if we were to imagine remote work using predictive services, more machine learning, all those things, that actually requires a whole lot of energy that isn't visible to us as users of the system but would need to be part and parcel of how we thought about the process. Right. Also, uh, sorry, on that, just uh, with remote work, and we've all sort of been thrown into this whether we were used to it or not, and I've done a lot of remote working with staff anyway, but I see a problem with, um, with that idea of being completely remote. Humans crave human mm. yeah, interaction, and it's something that is, is a great thing if you can have that human interaction, even if it's going to be part-time yeah. for people who are remote yeah. workers. I, um, agree with, I agree with you, but, but it's interesting that some people, you know, 
working at Facebook, I'm just using it on one example mm. based on what Mark Zuckerberg was saying, is that some people, and typically it's, it's um, more senior people in the organisation, are prepared to work remotely. But interestingly, the ones that don't want to work remotely are the new hires and the graduates. Mm. Yeah, of course. And so you can't... You can't sort of have two different cultures, one working and one, you know, physically, you know, sort of non-virtually and one working yeah. remotely. So it's, it actually poses really interesting questions of how you build and sustain a culture, not just in one company, but across the, across the whole spectrum if you've got a global well, and how company. You, and how you build equity, right? Because it's one mm. thing to say you're someone who has the luxury of building a home office that you can equip and use. It's another thing if you yeah. were taking your laptop and sitting on a bed whilst also looking at kids and dogs and parents yeah. and wondering how to make all of that work and what it means to be an effective worker may mean that you've actually got incredible inequities being yeah. reproduced. I want to take our next there question because it is it's very much on that theme. It's from Tony Wren in our studio audience. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, it's been a great discussion on inclusion and big ideas, but um, frankly, if you're thinking about where your next meal comes from, it's a bit hard to think. And in this country, we still have very high rates of poverty. Does the panel agree that we need to continue to stimulate our economy so we avoid a long and prolonged deep recession? And if so, do you also agree that one of the smartest things we could do and the right thing to do would be to continue to have unemployment payments and payments for students above the poverty line? We can never go back to $40 a day, which is the current government policy. So we'd love your ideas on that. Thanks very much. Ray Johnson, this is essentially about the idea of snapback, the current amounts that we're paying for job seeker, as it's termed. Yeah. Do you think that needs to continue? I think it does. I think it's frankly cruel to have people expected to survive well below the poverty line. You know, people aren't on these payments forever. It is a stopgap in between jobs. So if we can't give people the dignity of being able to live... You know, I, I recall trying to get by on the single parenting payment that I had. And by the time I paid for my rent and my bills and my electricity and you know, put some food in the fridge and enough petrol in the car to get back to the shops next fortnight, I had $5 left over for my son and I. That was in, if, in case anything happened, if there were any emergencies, I needed baby Panadol, $5. You know, and some people out there today have higher living expenses than I did because I lived in a rural area where I could get cheap rent. You know, trying to find somewhere to live on you know, these kinds of payments is impossible. When you hear politicians, though, describe the payments as being uh, there uh, not to, to effectively encourage you into work, what do, how do you, and just as context, I mean, you spent, I think, the first 11 years of your life living in... in I don't really know how you describe those conditions, yeah, yeah. but uh, difficult conditions. Oh, look, you know, my, my parents have worked hard my entire life. You know, my mum works in kitchens, my dad works in construction, he's a welder, and they've done their very best to be able to provide for us. But the, the early years, we were living in a shed with an outside toilet and, you know, we it was difficult to get by and I saw them struggle and, and, and it was hard. I don't think that supporting the poorest people within our society should ever be seen as a negative thing. You know, and, and to use it as some type of punishment, as a, you know, it will incentivise you to go get work if you're not being paid enough to live. How does that ever work? You know, this negative reinforcement, it just goes against everything that we know about human psychology and we, we need to be giving people the dignity of, of being able to live. Lucy Turb. Well, my impression is I don't think anyone's expecting it to go back to the pre-job seeker welfare level. And, and I think there's just... My understanding is I'm not an expert on this or have any specific knowledge, is that there's a, a discussion about where it should be in between the pre-COVID amount, which is $40 a day, $280 a week, if I, my maths is serving me well, versus, um, you know, 550 So the, the number will probably settle somewhere in between. There is a big problem with people needing to get back into the workforce. There is, I think, an even bigger problem potentially with underemployment, ongoing underemployment, which particularly affects women, particularly affects their ability to participate in the workforce. So there is a, there is a sort of a, a big mountain of, of employment and um, uh, participation issues that we have to address in the next 
a year or two while the, the post-pandemic world sort of renormalises, if that's what you're calling it, or resets, I think is probably a better way to describe it. So we've got to, we've got to appreciate and value the need for people to have dignity at the same time as them being trained and skilled to be able to participate in the workforce, if that's possible. All right. Well, that is all we've got time for tonight. A huge thanks to our panel, Ray Johnston, Lucy Turnbull, Alan Finkel, Genevieve Bell and Jordan Nguyen. And thanks to all of you who came to sit with us in the studio tonight. It's been terrific uh, to see some of you uh, and to you at home as well for sending in your videos and for watching us live. Join us next week as we take a look at Australia's energy future. Uh, we'll get into more of that conversation that we started tonight about getting the balance right in the future. Have a very good night.